Okay. Are you all set? Hillary is Hillary is is up there now talking about you. Okay. I have Graham to make him go second. So he's up there. All right. Good. And we can get started. I'm going to open up the work session of the Ways and Means Committee. And before I start, we have two substitutes this morning. Uh, for Representative Lang, has been replaced by Representative Howard Pearl. And Representative Mary Griffin has been replaced by Representative Carol McGuire. Uh, and on Mary Griffin, I was finally able to um, contact Mary. She's at a nursing home right now. A and thanks to uh, Representative Doucette, he, he put me in touch with another rep that gave me Mary's direct number. And while I was talking to Mary, uh, she asked if I would do a f her a favor. And she wanted me to call the nursing home to get somebody to come into her room to see her because she'd been waiting for so long for somebody because she, she needed them. So I promised her I would and I got in touch with the person that gave me the direct number and they took care of that. I have a card going around. I hope everybody signs it for Mary. My wife and I plan to go see her either tomorrow or Saturday, so, uh, and hopefully they'll cheer her up and she'll come back, I hope. All right. Now, we have 10 bills on the agenda this morning. The last bill is House Bill 10, oh, 1063 which had to do with uh, technical corrections for the DRA. We passed that out of this committee, and I held it because the Senate had Senate Bill 435, which is a, there's a lot of similarity with that bill. And I was waiting to see what the Senate did on that. They passed it out of committee amended, and it was supposed to have been heard in session when we had our session. Uh, it's going to be held in session on the 16th of this month. So what I'm going to do with 1063, I'm going to have Jennifer do a side-by-side -side comparison between Senate Bill 435 and House Bill 1063 so we can see what the differences are. Because I looked at my folder and I'm starting to get confused on the thing. And so the next time we meet, we'll have that side by side and I'll have the DRA to come in. So answer any questions and, and uh, make sure that the full committee understands what's going on both with the Senate bill and our bill, and then we can decide what action we want to take on that. So we're going to hold that off. So we'll go to House Bill 1097. Ten ninety seven is relative to taxation of income of New Hampshire residents when working remotely for an out-of-state employer. Let me just check my notes here. We're going to hold this bill because there's more work that needs to be done on it. Uh, they haven't been able to come up with an amendment that uh, is clear and would not raise confusions. Uh, Representative 
Spillsbury is working with Representative Janijian and to work this out with the DRA and also the somebody from the Attorney General's office. And hopefully we'll have a resolution to this and we'll hold this until our next work session and see where we go on that bill. Mr. Chair. Questions? Comments? Do, do we want to um, form a subcommittee officially on this one uh, to have some other reps uh, involved in the in this? What I'm going to do now is, is I'm having Representative Spillsbury and Representative Janijian work with mm -hmm. the Attorney General and the DRA because we're going to have very few bills and if we keep it as a very few bills, then I'm going to have the committee as a whole do the work of the subcommittee. Okay. And anybody that wants to work with um, Representative uh, Spellsbury and Janijian, get in touch with them. Uh, Representative Almy. Thank you. There's a lot of uh, difficult work, as I recall, between on between DRA and the AG's office about our uh, tax law and to what extent we would be violating our own tax law in, in this bill. And I'm wondering if it wouldn't be better to have an, a lawyer on our side involved in this, looking at it. Oh, uh, Instead uh, of just at a final definitely word yes. session. Uh, as close as we have, uh, Representative Spillsbury, you're an attorney, right? Uh -huh. and yeah. Mm -hmm. I am not a lawyer. They, so they, we, we have somebody from the Attorney General's <laughs> office mm -hmm. that, that's here now. Yes. And Hi, Sam. And what I'm assuming he's going to be working with these two representatives. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't have a solution at this point in time, um, but he's going to work to come up with a solution if it can be, if it can happen. It's not an easy thing to solve. I have a great deal of respect for Attorney Garland, but on it would be comforting to make sure that there's someone from DRA that's on top of this too. Uh, yes, Mr. Wong. <laughs> yeah, Kane is, is working the issue also. Great, thank you. <laughs> uh, I should say Mr. Wang. Wong. All right, any other questions or comments on 1097? The next bill is House Bill 1221 relative to the rates of the business profits tax and the business enterprise tax. And there's an amendment, I believe, It's on your desk, which is Amendment 0471H, which Representative Janijian, you want to talk about your amendment? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I've uh, passed out Amendment um, 0471H to HB 1221, and very simply, what I've done here is pretty much cut out, there were two taxes being cut here, the BPT, business profits tax, and the business enterprise tax, the BET. Um, I've removed the BET tax portion of this, so there would be no reduction to the BET tax. 
only the reduction to the b p t the business profits tax from seven point six to seven point five percent and based on the fiscal note in the bill yields about an eight million dollar reduction in revenues over the year however not lowering the b e t tax which was estimated as about i don't have it right in front of me about a twenty seven or twenty eight million dollar reduction could mean that the b p t doesn't drop as much the revenue loss so i guess it would be nice if we could have d r a maybe give us a new fiscal note on that piece but but i would i would argue that if we're going to lower any tax this is the tax to focus on it's the most visible tax to businesses and and outside people who are looking potentially to come to new hampshire i think a seven point five percent business profits tax looks favorable it looks favorable as compared to surrounding states vermont i believe was i may have this backwards vermont is i believe eight point three and mass is eight point oh or i've got the two mix but in any case the seven point five is enough of a difference that it highlights new hampshire's business friendly state but we also are looking at a fairly small drop in revenue going to point one percent okay i'll ask the d r a if they would come up with a new fiscal note based on on this amendment that they would only be doing the reduction and the b p t and not the reduction in the b e t how would that affect the fiscal note and then we can handle this the next at a next work session representative alany thank you uh mr chairman i've been having some conversation with chris shea from l b a o on about trying to figure out what the total effect of tax cuts is during that he he mentioned that these constant recalibrations of our tax rates is making it just about impossible to do any kind of longitudinal uh study of that because every single time they do one of these they do it based on the most recent kaffir and the kaffirs do not include a number of of things that affect that year that come later they show up a year or two later in the kaffir uh and it doesn't seem to me that we're going to get much out of a fiscal note but it also seems to me like this is not going to send much of a signal to the uh people in other states that might be thinking of coming to us but it is sending a signal to all of the companies that pay basically bet that they are going to continue to confront more of the load uh of the business taxes while the companies that make big profits don't thank you thank you for your comments representative alney a uh, representative ames yeah i just want to put this in context uh and by this i mean uh a further cut in our um revenues even though it's relatively small uh i just spent uh, yesterday evening at the jaffrey range cooperative school district deliberative session um which was in many ways a very heartening session for me a uh, strong support for the school district jaffrey is one of the property poor towns in uh, the state uh, 30th from the bottom along with uh you're probably about the same place charlestown a little bit higher maybe um the effect of the budget recommended by the school committee will be about a $4 increase in the property tax rate if you trace back to the state aid to jaffrey it's been going down 
not just because of a shrinkage of the population, the school population, because there's less of it. And um, that's a big problem. So property taxes is down, state BBT down, or keep it at least at the same level. Maybe we can do something about the property tax. I've been working hard, as some know, <coughs> on uh, reform of our school funding system. It depends on tax revenue from uh, all of our collective sources at the state level. Uh, we can't really do anything about that property tax problem if we don't have revenue. Um, so we've got a bit, maybe you could call it a dilemma. We've got to figure this out. When I see cuts like this, I think about what's happening at the local level in places like Jaffrey and the, how it affects the school children in the Jaffrey Ringe uh, Cooperative School District. And as I say, there was strong support, a lot of uh, hand wringing and unhappiness about the tax rate, but strong support for the school district in that meeting, which was well attended, by the way, and had both sides of the argument well presented. So I just wanted to put that in context. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Representative Ames. Further questions or comments? Uh, Representative Almy. I'd just like to add on to that, that last fall there was a virtual meeting of the BIA, the annual legislative uh, conference. Uh, and I listened into the part about business taxes with businessmen. And they were, they were taught what, what the businessmen there were saying once somebody from the audience asked a question that was relayed to them was that they either didn't know what part of what taxes they were paying, they just got given the full amount that they were paying, or they did know and they knew that the property tax was the biggest part of their tax bill. Now, when we're trying to help businesses, the question is, are we trying to help all businesses that are in this state? that come from this state and are staying in this state? Or are we only trying to help the ones that are flitting around the country, uh, developing huge profit margins and moving when it seems likely that one or the other uh, state is offering them more? Thank you. Uh, Representative Spillsbury. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I very much appreciate the comments of Representative Ames. I share the concern um, that if taxes at the state level are cut too substantially, it just uh, drives the need on the local level further. Um, and I will be looking uh, forward for ways to enhance the state's participation in education costs. So taking in balance four tax cut proposals that are before us, if I was to choose one that I would support, it would be this cut of uh, a tenth of a percent to follow through on a prior uh, series of cuts and a commitment uh, and get to a, a number that I think people would remember and uh, view positively. So when it comes to the proposals to cut the uh, communications tax, um, or the BET, um, I, I will look less favorably on those, but I'm open-minded to this one. And so if we can think of it selectively and come to a consensus that there's one small incremental cut, I would suggest this would be it. Thank you for your comment, Representative Spillsbury. Further questions or comments? All right, then we will deal with this at our next work session.
The next bill is House Bill 1430-FN-A, repealing the tax on rentals of motor vehicles under the Meals and Rooms Tax. Uh, Representative Bromney. Do you want me to speak to this now or make the motion? Um, um, I'd like to make the motion, actually, if we go to executive okay, session. Okay, um, then we will go into executive session on House Bill 1430, Representative Bromney. Thank you. I, I move uh, ITL on House Bill 1430. Do we have a second on ITL? Representative Ames. Representative Bromley, you can speak to your motion. Yes, thank you. Um, this, call, this bill calls for the phasing out of the uh, motor vehicle rental tax. Uh, and going then, some of you on this committee, I think I'm looking to my right and to my left here, were around when this tax was put into place uh, post Claremont decision and when they were looking for funding for education. It's not a big dollar amount, it's only about $8 million what we're talking about, uh, but believe it or not, uh, the majority here in this, this committee uh, agrees with what a lot of what Representative Ames was saying, uh, and that we, we want to tread lightly on, on the cuts that we do, uh, and this is one that we don't, don't think it's, it's worth uh, cutting. There's, there's various reasons for that. First off, every other state has this car rental tax, and our 8.5% car rental tax is quite modest compared to other states. I mean, really modest. And I, I, you heard me speak about this in one of our other uh, meetings about, about how other states tack on all sorts of other fees on top of their tax. And we, we, just, we just have a pure 8 point, it was nine, it's, it's gonna be 8.5%. So quite modest. Now Enterprise, who testified, claimed that more locales rent than out-of-staters. Uh, more locals, I should say, uh, rent than out-of-staters. And that may be true, but when we probed a little bit, it turns out that a lot of those in-state renters are renting cars for, uh, if their car is wrecked or if it's in for maintenance. Uh, and guess what? And many of those, especially the car uh, uh, repair shops, uh, uh, the insurance is paying for it, not the individual. So, uh, so I have no problem continuing the tax for tourists and, and out-of-state business travelers that come here. Uh, I think it's just returning the same favor that the other states do to us. Um, I mean, it's, <laughs> and, they, and they, they treat us, wow. And I, you know, like I said, I used to travel just about every week. So I, I, know, I know pretty much know all the rates in all these other states. Then we also heard from our state treasurer uh, at the economic briefing uh, several weeks ago. And one of, the, one of the key things, we have to worry about our bond rating. And one of the, one of the things that, that the bond rating agencies like to see is the diversity of taxes that we have to buffer against ups and downs in certain segments of the economy. So this is just one small piece of that diversity. Again, six to seven, I said eight million before, it's really six to seven million. Uh, that we're talking about with this. So if one, if, if business taxes are going for whatever reason, certain segments of our economy drop, at least we have some other sources of revenue. That's why we like to have different sources of revenue. And that's the same logic that we, I think we had with the uh, telecommunication tax. Again, that wasn't a big tax, but it was it's something that uh, we, we used to balance our portfolio of taxes, if you will, so, um, so with that, and, and given all of what we have been talking about in this committee for the last couple of months, do you, do we still have all these unknowns about, about where the PPP refunds are gonna come in, uh, where the, the new provisions for the credit carry forwards are gonna come in in terms of dollars that uh, we're gonna have to give back to to the various businesses that are, uh, now we put a limit on how much could be carried forward. Uh, and that was, that was just the first step. That's gonna continue, we're gonna continue cranking that down over time. And then of course, the, the phasing out of the stimulus money. 
uh, and uh, we have to really see what, what that's done to propping up our economy, and it, it could be, uh, you know, the revenues may not be flowing as, as fast as before. So with that, I, I would uh, suggest that we all vote ITL on this, and I, I think it's the prudent thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Bromney. Any further questions or comments on the motion of ITL? Representative Ames. Just to say that I, I support the motion, and um, I would also add that um, I think it was a year ago or so that we worked on this uh, this tax and uh, made sure it was broadly applicable to uh, comparable transactions. And um, throughout that discussion, I don't remember any effort to uh, bring to our attention the need to uh, repeal the tax. Uh, I have not heard that said to me, you know, that hasn't been said to me uh, during all my time here. It seems to be a tax that, uh, that exists and most people accept it as a reality of life. No matter where you go, you pay a tax when you rent a car. And this is the New Hampshire's version. So I would leave it th the way it is. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Ames. Any further questions or comments? I agree with you, Representative Ames. That's been around for a while, since 1999, when they had this special committee to sol resolve the Claremont education. And that was that tax on automobile rentals was added at that point in time. So, saying no further questions, I ask the clerk to call the vote on the motion of ITL on House Bill 1430. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll begin the roll call vote on House Bill 1430. The motion is ITL. We start with Representative Abrami. Yes. Representative McGuire. Yes. Representative Ulrich. Yes. Representative Doucette. Yes. Representative Pearl. Yes. The clerk votes yes. Representative Janigian. Yes. Representative Nunez. Yes. Representative Spilsbury. Yes. Representative Tudor. Yes. Representative Aaron. Yes. Representative Almy. Yes. Represent yes. Representative, I got you down for two yes votes, Representative Almy. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Ames. Oh, yes. Representative Malloy. Yes. Representative, the Honorable Representative Thomas C. Schomburg. Mr. Clerk, I vote yes. Thank you, sir. Representative Tucker? Yes. Give me one moment. <laughs> so now I closed out. I appreciate your patience. Thank you. We're back back online. Representative Gomarlo. Yes. Representative Hacken Phillips. She's not here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Representative <laughs> Murphy. Yes. Chairman Major. Yes. Nineteen to nothing. The vote being nineteen to nothing. Uh, the motion of ITL passes, and without objection, we go on consent. I don't see any objection, so. The next bill is House Bill 1450-FN encoding agricultural resources under the Land and Community Heritage Investment Program. Uh, Representative Ames. Are we still in executive session? We're in executive session. Okay, I move ITL on uh, House Bill 1450. Ames moves ITL, seconded by Representative Uli. Representative Ames, you want to speak to your motion? Yeah, I would simply say that uh, first I, I commend uh, the um, 
proponent of this bill, the prime sponsor, in bringing it forward for discussion and examination. Um, we also uh, had the benefit of a, a, an impressive and serious uh, set of presentations by people who know this subject, and particularly the agricultural side of, uh, of this subject uh, uh, far better than we do. And uh, that was helpful and thoughtful and productive. I think uh, the, the, the reason that I uh, am recommending ITL is, uh, um, is twofold. I think uh, first the LCHIP program uh, writ large it has wide support in New Hampshire. Um, it's achieved somehow an appropriate balance in its funding mechanism and in what it does, and it does good work. I mean, you really don't hear any any criticism of what it's doing. Um, it does good work. Uh, and I'm concerned that we may upset that balance and that uh, achievement of uh, a, a level of excellence that uh, we can all support by going forward with this bill at this time. Testimony from Commissioner Jasper uh, indicated that the ag agricultural interests um, that this bill seeks, seeks to uh, bring forward are definitely considered within the frame of the current legislation. So I just as soon leave it, leave it at that and uh, leave the program to march along. And maybe at another time, it will be appropriate to uh, both uh, uh, provide an emphasis on agriculture and provide additional funding. But I don't think this is the time. So that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Ames. Any further questions or comments on House Bill 1450? Saying none, then I'll ask the clerk to call the vote on ITL on House Bill 1450. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just quickly for the record, I don't have who seconded that motion by Representative Representative Ewell. Ewell. Thank you. We will begin the voting with Representative Abrami. Yes. McGuire. Yes. Ulrey. Yes. Doucette. Yes. Pearl. Yes. Burstein votes yes. Janigian. Yes. Nunez. Yes. Spilsbury. Yes. Tudor. Yes. Aaron. Yes. Almy. Yes. Representative Ames. Yes. Malloy. Thomas C. Schomburg. Representative Schomburg votes yes. Thank you. Representative Tucker? Yes. Go Marlowe? Yes. It's Hack and Phillips? Not yet. Representative Murphy? Yes. Chairman Major? Yes. 19 to low. The vote being 19 to 0, the motion of ITL passes. Without objection, it will go on consent. I see no objection, so it will appear on the consent calendar. We're still in executive session. And the next bill is House Bill 1478-FN-A relative to the business profits tax applicable to certain large, low-wage employers. Representative Bernstein. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that House Bill 1478 is inexpedient to legislate. Representative Bernstein moves inexpedient to legislate. Do we have a second? Representative Nunes. Representative Bernstein, you want to speak to your motion? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. This bill made me re recall, or it evoked memories of my grandmother, and I'd like to share a short story with you. In the mid-60s, maybe 1966 or so, my grandmother took my brother, sister, and I to a nursing home where my great-grandmother was. 
Unfortunately, they only allowed two kids in there at once, so my brother and sister, being older than me, got to go into the nursing home to visit my great-grandmother. They left me in the car with the back window rolled down a little bit so I could get some air. <laughs> when they came out, after visiting my great-grandmother, they each had a full Hershey bar. These aren't the little Hershey bars, the what they call fun size, which I don't know why they call the little ones the fun size. But uh, I guess my grandmother saw the look in my eyes and she insisted that my brother and sister each give me half of the Hershey bar. My, my brother objected, saying, but that'll mean Alan gets a full Hershey. My grandmother interrupted and said, don't you be selfish or I'll slap you down. So they each had to give me half of the Hershey bar. <laughs> Well, this bill, House Bill 1478, is, I understand where it's coming from. It's compassion and uh, the intent is good, but it, it's, the bill is sort of, it, it's so flawed, it's, it's nonsensical and it negates the intent of the bill. Um, what this bill does is, for any employer with more than 100 employees, if any one employee makes $15 or less, it subjects that business to a surtax, raising the business profits tax from 7.6% to 8%. Um, there, there are many deficiencies with the bill, and I'll highlight the, the main one, and that is this is clearly unconstitutional. Uh, specifically when considering the clause included in Part 2, Article 5 of the New Hampshire Constitution regarding equal and proportional tax rates. Uh, for, for that's the primary reason I'll, I'll spare you all uh, all the other reasons because I just can't get by the constitutionality of this. For that reason, I suggest that this bill be ITL'd. Thank you, Representative Bernstein. Any other c comments? on the motion of ITL. Saying none, I'll ask the clerk to call the vote on the motion of ITL on House Bill 1478. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We will begin the voting yes. with Representative Abrami. Yes. Representative McGuire. Yes. Ullery. Yes. Doucette. Yes. Pearl. Yes. Burstein votes yes. Janigian. Yes. Nunez. Yes. Spillsbury. Yes. Tudor? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Almy? Yes. Yes. Representative Ames? Yes. Malloy? Yes. Thomas C. Schomburg? I say yes. My wife is one from Jamie. I have you down as a yes vote. Representative Tucker? Yes. Representative Gomarlo? No. Representative Murphy? Yes. Chairman Major? Yes. The motion carries 18 to 1. The motion passes with a vote of 18 to 1 of ITL on 1478. Representative Gamalo, do you have a minority report? I do, and I object to consent, consent calendar. That's why I asked you the question. Thank you. It will go on the regular calendar. So next is House Bill 1494, relative to property tax exemptions concerning certain communication services leases. Uh, we're Still in executive session, Representative Jean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, move inexpedient to legislate on HB 1478. Representative Jean. I'm sorry. Uh, moves. Oops. I say the ITL on House Bill 1494. 1494, yes. I need a second. Second here, Mr. Chairman. Second, Representative Schamberg. Representative Eugene, you can speak Thank to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this bill, um, while well-meaning, and I think we had some testimony that suggested that if the communications tax was cut for uh, telecom and cable companies, it would help result in um, bringing 
high-speed services to more households. However, there's nothing in the bill that requires that, and there's nothing that suggests that that would have to happen. So um, the, the other side of this is that cutting taxes on those companies will result in, in potentially towns and cities having to raise taxes on other um, entities and taxpayers. Um, in addition to that, there's the question of constitutionality with this bill. Um, you know, it, it, it seems, it, it looks like it would not pass constitutional muster given that you are selecting certain companies not to have to pay uh, property taxes. So for these reasons, um, I move ITL on this bill. Thank you, Representative Genesee. And further comments on the motion of ITL? Saying none, I'll ask the clerk to call the vote. Thank you, Mr. The Chair. The motion is ITL for House Bill 1494. We will begin the voting with Representative Abrami. Yes. Representative McGuire. Yes. Representative Ullery. Yes. Doucette. Yes. Pearl. Yes. Burstein votes yes. Janigian. Yes. Nunez. Yes. Spilsbury. Yes. Tudor. Yes. Aaron? Yes. Representative Almy? Yes. Representative Ames? Yes. Representative Thomas C. Southworth? <laughs> Appreciate that. I'm glad you're, you're looking out for me. <laughs> Representative Malloy? Yes. Representative Thomas C. Schomburg? Yes. Representative Tucker? Yes. Representative Gomarlo? Representative Murphy. Yes. Chairman Major. Yes. 19 to 9. The vote been 19 to 0 on the motion of ITL. That passes on House Bill 1494. Without objection, it will go on consent. I see no objection, so House Bill 1494 will go on the consent calendar. Mr. Chairman? Um, yes. I'm not sure. I know that Hacken Phillips was hoping to be here. Uh, now she's testifying somewhere, waiting probably to testify on whether, but I think we could go forward since we have an understanding about her input. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I spoke to her earlier. Okay. Uh, well, let's get a motion first. We're okay. ready. Executive session, uh, Representative Bromley. I move uh, in expedient to legislate on House Bill 1509. And do we have a second? Representative I'll second. <sighs> Representative Bromley, would you speak to your motion? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this bill terminates the uh, FM FRM Victims Contribution Recovery Fund, and I guess it would cancel out all of the the uh, funding that's uh, already been uh, passed in, in uh, House Bill 2. And uh, this is the Financial Resources Mortgage FRM Victims Contribution Fund that was established a couple of years ago, but just funded uh, this past uh, budget uh, with 5 million fiscal year ending June 30th of 22 and another 5 million uh, for fiscal year ending June 30th, 2023. From the testimony, there is no question that the state failed at its oversight responsibility, thus leading to the failure of FRM and harm to its investors. This $10 million combination, uh, the two five millions, in no way covers for all the losses incurred by the investors in this fund. If we pass this bill to repeal this fund and the money already appropriated, it would be a classic bait and switch by the state of New Hampshire, which in my opinion 
would be an embarrassment to the state if we did this. Uh, please vote ITL, and I, I'd appreciate your vote on this. Thank you. Uh, Representative Almey. Thank you. Um, we are, the lawyers in our group cannot remember that any state has ever compensated uh, investors uh, that lost their shirts uh, without being forced to buy a lawsuit, uh, which did not occur in this case. Um, but um, those of us in, in on the Democratic side of the aisle uh, believe that it is too late at this point to stop the process of distribution, that it would be an even worse precedent to um, stop distributing once we have sent out information to investors that this exists and that they should apply. So we are voting ITL with the majority. And uh, there will be a short statement about some members uh, feeling that we should not stop the process at this point. Added to the blurb. Thank you. Uh, and that will happen. Uh, Representative Ames. Yeah, I just wanted to add that this, I see this as a unique situation that uh, grew out of uh, a bad behavior by uh, certain people in the private sector and then a, uh, a confused and discombobulated and, uh, and harmful response from uh, the st state side. And, uh, and that led to years of uh, effort by investors uh, who had been scammed to uh, somehow recover some funds and uh, ended uh, where we are today with this, uh, um, I think, too late effort to try to repeal what uh, was decided last year. So I stand with that uh, repeal, but I also want to note that the state has taken significant action since um, since this came to light in the early part of the 2000s. Um, and uh, we heard about that. We had testimony, and that was good. Um, the uh, um, Looking forward, we can be hopeful that uh, this won't happen again, but I would reiterate that this is a unique situation, and I would expect that uh, investors need to keep their eyes open uh, as well and not depend on um, state guidance to bail them out if their investment goes bad. Thank you, Representative Ames. Representative Schoenberg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, notwithstanding what the ranking member and the vice ranking member have said, uh, one point I did ask the AG, has this ever gone to a court of record? Uh, if the state was liable, and were they responsible? And both times, not to his knowledge. A and uh, I sort of get an answer to that one, uh, to my question. The second part is... Uh, Ronald Reagan, President Reagan said, uh, party, th his party does not believe in bailouts. He believes in personal responsibility. And he said that the approach that they were dealing with uh, back then on a particular item was charity. And even though I'm gonna vote with our majority, I, I feel that the state is providing charity to these individuals that should have uh, taken more personal responsibility. Thank you. Further comments, Representative Urley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've had some experience taking cases to court, uh, <coughs> and not as a lawyer, but as supporting uh, lawyers. And my observation has been that when somebody loses in court, they lose more than if a settlement out of court had been made. And I look at this uh, uh, arrangement that the state has made under FRM as a settlement out of court, saving the state a lot of money 
as we heard in testimony and testimony and testimony because of some malfeasance on the part of uh, various state operators, which would have most likely have uh, wound up with a, uh, I'll use somebody else's language from New York, huge settlement. But uh, so I'm in favor of the ITL motion. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Yearly. Any further comments? Representative Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, of all the bills this session, this is the one that's probably given me the most angst personally uh, for two reasons. One is that I was, to be consistent, I voted last summer to support the amendment to eliminate the $10 million for support of this fund in the amendment uh, 1064H. I'm also of the same opinion as Ronald Reagan and Representative Schamberg that personal responsibility and the accountability of, uh, of the state needs to be considered if there is any uh, malfeasance on their part, but the state as a bailout you know, mechanism for investors that uh, lost money to me is a horrible precedent. So in, in large part, I am concerned by myself being inconsistent because I will probably vote with the majority in our, our, our caucus but it does give me angst to vote, in a sense, for bailout of investors and also to be inconsistent with my previous vote of last summer. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Murphy. Further comments? Representative Almey. Thank you. This one is more personal, but it's an example of the problems that our Attorney General's office has had when I arrived and still has. It's understaffed and purposefully, I think, and it does not provide consumer protection support to the ordinary citizen of New Hampshire. Uh, as an example, there was a fraudulent roofer that took in I think it was eight people on our side of the Connecticut River, uh, three of them in my complex. Uh, two of them, it took the roof off and then didn't come back, and the others, it, it took, had taken the, he'd taken the deposit and he didn't come back. Uh, there were, I think, 28 victims on the other side of the Connecticut River. The Attorney General of Vermont went after the guy uh, got him locked up, got him condemned to restitution for the Vermonters. Nothing was done on our side of the river. And it was a significant loss for some of my neighbors. Uh, and not to mention that they had to live through the winter with a plastic covering where the roof had been. Uh, and. Uh, I do not think that any other state probably does as bad a job of consumer protection for multiple cases like that as we do. And it's because they don't have enough people to work it. They also don't have enough people to help with the condominium problems, which is one of my pet peeves. <laughs> so thank you. Just getting it off my chest. Thank you, Representative Almey. Representative Ames. Yeah, just a note uh, on this question of inconsistency. I, too, uh, suffer the uh, inconsistency angst, but uh, not so much because I think uh, once you s – it's sort of the uh, bait and switch metaphor that uh, Representative Brahmi used. Uh, is that I think that's the metaphor you used. Um, we've started down a road. We've uh, – Gotten, gone past that vote and started up a program. It's in place. Uh, so they've solicited applications. They're uh, processing applications if they've come in. Uh, we've started down a road. And it's, it's just too late to close that barn door, to use another metaphor. Um, and, uh, and so off we go, and, and I think we go with uh, a lot of concern, but that's where we are. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Ames. 
Any further comments? Seeing none, I'll ask the court to call the vote on the motion of ITL on House Bill 1509. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We will begin the voting with Representative Abrami. Yes. Representative McGuire. Yes. Representative Ogilvy. Yes. Representative Doucette. Yes. Representative Pearl. Yes. The clerk votes yes. Representative Janigian. Yes. Representative Nunez. Yes. Representative Spilsbury. Yes. Representative Tudor. Yes. Representative Aaron. Yes. Representative Almy. Yes. Representative Ames. Yes. Representative Malloy. Yes. Representative Thomas C. Schomburg. Yes, Mr. Clerk. Thank yes. you, sir. Representative Tucker. Yes. Representative Go Marlow. Yes. Representative Murphy. Yes. And Chairman Major. Yes. The vote being 19 to 0. The mo 1509 passes with the motion of ITL. Uh, I'll ask the question. Uh, is there objection to go on the consent calendar? Representative Yearly. Figure so. He didn't hear you. He said that. Uh, no objection. But I was cautioning the motion maker and the seconder that this will likely be pulled off. I think I'm going to put this on the regular calendar. Yeah. As uh, well, we need some explanation. Mr. Chairman, if you're going to do that, we might have a lengthy discussion because we we might have to talk on our side of it as well, and then there would be the side of the people that did the motion. Okay, then I'll reverse my decision on that and put it on the consent calendar, and if it gets pulled off, then we will have the discussion. Thank you, Representative Elmy. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, on House Bill 1524, um, that is going to be, we're going to continue working on that. Uh, Representative Spilsbury, um, let me see. House Bill 1524, establish a National could Service a Alumni Attraction and Retention Fund. Now? And there is an amendment. By Representative Schamberg. Uh, Representative Schamberg, you want to speak to your amendment? I will defer to Representative Spilsbury first. Okay. Representative Spilsbury. We're in work session now. Right. Um, so I'm not prepared to make uh, a motion at this time. Uh, I think it's important to hear Representative Schamberg uh, explain his amendment. I would just uh, <laughs> suggest that uh, uh, we have serious reservations about this, and I think those reservations uh, will carry to the amendment as well, but uh, I think we need to hear what you've done and uh, how you believe it changes the bill. Thank you, Representative Spilsbury. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Representative Spilsbury. Uh, Schamberg. <laughs> Schamberg. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what initially was a, I thought, an easy bill. I should never think that. Uh, Representative Ames pointed out some drafting questions on the original bill and uh, went to the sponsor and we drafted the first amendment and uh, the, uh, ma the majority ranking member did point out some things to us because of our institutional knowledge. 
uh, that maybe we should look at this redrafting again. And we did that, and we came up with a second one. And then there were some more questions, just about word placement, uh, who had responsibility, who has control of the money. And what we took out was the ARPA funds, the actual wording of the ARPA funds out of uh, uh, Roman numeral two. And uh, thought we had it done when we came up with this amendment, but there's been some question about uh, the amount of money to be hereby appropriated. And I would like the opportunity to go back to the OLS and ask them to look at how the money will be appropriated. Uh, it, it looks as it, it's a demand versus a, an approach of a decision by the governor and the executive council. And that's where the sponsor and I believe it should be. Um, th there were two words that had to be added in, in the uh, original section four, room numeral one. Y you couldn't, uh, permissible use had to be established. So the workforce development word on line nine and the word education had to be added if this were to be approved. And then on room numeral two, uh, this is where the ARPA money was stated in the beginning when Representative Ames talked about the drafting. Uh, it is now a generic approach of uh, additional gifts, grants, donations, or bequeaths, or any federal, state, or local funds uh, from any source. Uh, that made it more than what was said before. It just said it shall come from ARPA, which we did not, the sponsor did not wish that, and did, does not wish it to come out of the general fund also. And then the new article, uh, the new section five, um, it put an amount in, but is it, but put a statement is hereby appropriated, and uh, it, with certain federal funds, you can't say you must, a and so would like to take it back, Mr. Representative Spillsbury, for maybe a fourth redrafting, which may clear up some of the issues that you had brought up. We're going to hold this for further for a further work session, and you'll get an opportunity to do that. Representative Bromley, uh, Representative Almy, followed by Representative Bromley. Thank you. Um, I'm a little confused by this. Um, the process that is set up is that the money is appropriated, on and then the governor shall do determine if there are discretionary funds appropriated in ARPA. Um, this was cleared with the sponsor. And it also, um, what it means and what has happened in the past is that the governor, if he decides that there isn't any money in there because he wanted to use it for something else, can just not do it. And that can be a problem, but the sponsor also understood this. Um, and it's not such a problem for them because the governor has a member, as a person on their, um, their board who is constantly involved with what they're doing. And, um, and the governor seems to approve of this. So, um, it is what we're talking about is taking money from ARPA that will disappear if it's not used um, and um, putting this not very big amount, three quarters of a million dollars for over three years uh, into a board that is trying to increase its work with employers around the state to keep people that are valuable to the state of New Hampshire in New Hampshire working and includes some help in AmeriCorps and Return Peace Corps volunteers getting the further education that will make them more valuable 
So um, it seemed like a very good bang for the buck. And the buck isn't ours, the buck is the federal government's. Thank you. R Representative Bromney. Yeah, just uh, two comments on this. Uh, I think somewhere in here you should say that the, the, the state treasurer creates a fund and it's administered by the commission or Department of Administrative Services, but it's really the fund is created and maintained by the treasurer. I've had other bills where that language, so you may want to check with OLS on that. And uh, and then the uh, is, unless it's in there, I, I I just scanned it here. I didn't I didn't see it. But and then the other thing, I, I, when I read line 23, 22 and 23, it does sound like state money. This is the sum of 750000 for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 23, is hereby appropriated. Are we, are we talking state money? We are not talking state money. Yeah, but when I read that, it sounds like state money. Drafting. Okay. If, if I could, the drafter put in, on uh, if there is not enough money in ARPA, it's going to come out of the general fund, and we took it out. Okay. But I'm just saying, I, I don't know, that. It just well, a casual reader here. Uh, it just sounds like it's going to be state money. So I'd, I'd I'd make sure it's not that. Representative Brahmi, in line seven, it says there is hereby established in the state treasury, okay, on national. Okay, there we go. Thank you. I can't read very well. <laughs> Representative, Aaron. I scanned too fast. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I have a question to the committee. I'm new at this, uh, obviously. Um, uh, is there any other organization that has got a fund set up like this? You know, similar to the Peace Corps or AmeriCorps? Or are there any other organizations that we fund in this way? We would have to check that out, uh, Representative Almy. Yeah. I mean we have, I, don't, I forget, about 350 dedicated funds at this point. Some of them are just donations, and most of those are dead funds that we're weeding out as we go. Um, a lot, most of them are getting money either as a percentage of some fee or some tax and uh, or they got an appropriation from the state or a federal or other source uh, that frequently was one time and is meant to be revolving or meant just to finish after a while. And this one, the, the people who got, who are asking for the money, the board for, uh, uh, what do they call that board? The the uh, Volunteer New Hampshire Board, uh, they went into this expecting that it was going to last them three years and that during that time they would develop enough more contacts within the business community that they would be able to keep going on that basis. Okay. Representative Bernstein followed by Representative mm -hmm. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On February 2nd, the, the prime sponsor of the bill made a reference to $750,000 over three years. And Representative Almy, you just referenced that twice. Where is that language in the bill or the amendment, the three-year part? Um, actually, the way that we did it, they were saying either 250 a year or 750 and we just decided, okay, give them the 750, they're gonna use it over three years. If there's still some left at the end, since it's a dedicated fund until we get around to, to repealing it at some point, um, it would, uh, it would uh, probably be used in the fourth year. And if they but decided to go two years, they could. But to be clear, the appropriation is a one-time appropriation of 750000 And is it possible for that money to be depleted before three years or two years or one year? I should think it could be. Okay. Uh, the governor's person on the council would probably have a problem with that. Thank you. 
Representative Mur Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in response to Representative Aaron's uh, uh, question, I, 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 I don't think we are supporting the various organizations by the wording here. It says uh, AmeriCorps alumni, um, returned Peace Corps volunteers, people have completed one or more terms in the civil service. So I think what we're really trying to do is not support those organizations, but attract and bring back those qualified and dedicated individuals. So that, to me, makes a difference as in the sense that we're not supporting an individual organization, but more an attraction of trying to attract good qualified people to work in the state. Representative Tucker. Yes, I think, uh, Representative Aaron, uh, you weren't here to hear the testimony that began the process. And I don't remember the name of the report, but there was a report on how do we keep good people here in New Hampshire who are leaving. And there's a lot of effort to understand why it is that we have trouble attracting and keeping young, younger workers. And there was a report, and it suggested this kind of process that would allow small amounts of money to be matched for educational grants that would keep this very group of people, many of whom leave. So it, it wasn't so much that it was started on the basis that there was a precedent already for such a fund, but that this was a way to meet today's demands of young people to make New Hampshire more attractive. So it was a workforce development uh, report. And does anyone remember the name of the report? Oh. Here. Yes, um, I've got it in my hand. It was passed out to us, I think, in the white folder that they sent yes. us. And any of us could get you a copy of it. Representative Aaron. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that, Representative Tucker. Um, are, are we aware of any other states that um, do this sort of, um, you know, have this sort of uh, fund. fund available? Well, I th uh, at the, Mr. Chair, at the present time, no. The New Hampshire would be the first in the nation to uh, address and approach it this way. Thank you. Representative Hackett Phillips. I all right. <laughs> Representative Spillsbury. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think there are a number of uh, uh, questions and arguments that could be made whether this is a good idea in the first place to be the first state to do this and what exactly motivates it. Um, I, I understood from Representative Wilhelm's testimony that this was driven largely by workforce development objectives, but a careful read of the commission's report, which he authored, I think reaffirms my impression that, in fact, uh, the Peace Corps program itself and the AmeriCorps program itself are substantially driven by workforce development objectives, and it's the experience of spending two years overseas in the Peace Corps or a year or more in the AmeriCorps that in fact prepares um, a young person to be attractive uh, in the workforce or to be better prepared to get the most out of further education. Um, Representative Wilhelm's report is really quite effective in that respect and uh, there's another uh, uh, extensive piece that was also included in that packet that primarily dwells on how well prepared those individuals are when they emerge from the program. So I'm, I'm suspecting that what really is the motive behind the bill is uh, the attraction and retention, the question of, um, you know, not even so much whether they've enhanced uh, work, but can we keep them in the state? Well, who are they? And, uh, you know, one would hope that uh, New Hampshire uh, youth who go through this program would return to the state. Um, one might hope that uh, uh, people who come from other states and spend a year here in AmeriCorps uh, choose to stay. I think those are really valid objectives. But I think that uh, it still raises a question whether 
this is the right mechanism and whether they should be truly singled out. So for example, if we're going to dedicate a certain amount of funds, what's the distinguishing uh, feature that uh, allows us to target the money to these individuals but exclude um, a wide array of uh, young people whose prospects are equally bright and whose uh, presence in the state would be equally valuable. I don't see that distinguishing uh, criteria in the bill. In fact, I think the bill suffers from a lack of uh, specific and useful parameters. It really doesn't indicate um, how much, for how long, for what purpose, with what conditions, with what performance expectations or requirements and what outcomes. If I, as a benefactor, chose to establish a scholarship um, fund, I would lay out those criteria. And they're completely absent in this bill, which leads me to believe it's just going to be a wide open rulemaking exercise. So I think the bill has flaws. And in, I would just uh, go back to Representative Alamy's point. The, um, the idea that the funds can be up to 250 per year for three years and would come from ARPA funds is clear in, you, in your statement, but it is not clear in the bill. Thank you, Representative Spellsbury. Further discussion? Uh, Representative Alman. Thank you. I'd like to point out we are talking about a small organization which has ties to the Peace Corps volunteers and the uh, AmeriCorps alumni uh, from around the country as well as here. Um, and that this committee, after a huge amount of work and uh, on arguing, approved an enormous amount of money to go to the Army uh, program in Manchester uh, for similar purposes, but specifically for bio, uh, uh, how do you call it, bio, biomechanical, uh, bio advanced, advanced, advanced manufacturing, regenerative, regenerative manufacturing. Ma manufacturing technology, yes. Uh, and we still don't have a report on that, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> Further comments? Then uh, we have some work to do on this bill. So we'll put it into the pile to discuss at the next work session. Madam Chair, I have one interesting matter to mention now about Yes. Um, Representative Bromley is on the Tax Expenditure Committee. And uh, since Representative Almy has asked about a report, Rep Representative Bromley. Okay. Uh, it, uh, w Representative Ames is aware of this. Uh, in our next meeting on the 25th of February, we have invited Army in. I finally tracked down the right person, uh, Maureen Tui. Uh, who, who deals, who would know something about the tax uh, break part that we gave. And then we invited James uh, Key, uh, James Key uh, Wallace, who knows something about the tuition forgiveness part of this. So uh, we hope to, to uh, uh, although Tui, uh, Noreen Tui told me, she <laughs> it's amazing, I don't really know how many people, have, how many co small companies have taken, taken advantage of the program. The Department of Revenue kind of hints that, yes, there's at least one, because they won't tell us, but, uh, but since they won't tell us, it's under 10. Now, I called the commissioner the other day um, in uh, Revenue, uh, Department of Revenue, and I said, can you help us out a little bit here? I know, I know we're not allowed to, but it'd be helpful if we do, you don't have to give us names of companies or anything like that, just to have a dollar amount. How many, uh, you know, or uh, how many company, you know, how much, how much of a tax break have we given to date 
from this program. And then when I talked to uh, Key Wallace, he said they just got the rules through. <laughs> yeah. So he says, right now, zero of taking pace of the train. So, but if anybody's interested and want to hear it, it's, uh, it's at 9 o'clock on the, on the uh, 20, 25th. Uh, we're, we're, we're bringing the right people in the room to, to give us an update. I think it will be live. I think all these things are live streamed, yes. And uh, interestingly enough, I, was, I managed to, because Representative Ames and I and uh, Senator Guider are, are also on the uh, Charitable Gaming Committee, I, I, I managed to get us in the same room. And, and uh, uh, you know, this is a House committee, so we're not allowed to use the Senate room, but we're going to use the Senate room <laughs> for an hour and a half before the and they were so gracious enough to allow us to use the Senate room that we're going to be in for the other. So um, anyway, if you're interested in it, it's on the 25th. I'll, I'll make another announcement before yeah. we get there. Thank yeah. you. I would recommend that you either do it virtually or, or go to it because it's something that we ought to be aware of what the results of this bill that we passed, I think, four years ago. And... Uh, Right, and so we need to get what's the feedback? Has it worked? And, uh, okay. Uh, any further discussion on 1524? Seeing none, we're going to discuss it at a future work session, which hasn't been set yet. And the last bill is House Bill 1565-FN relative to the op opioid ab abatement trust fund. Uh, <coughs> that has, we're gonna continue working on that. There's a lot of issues that are open on that. Uh, we're not ready, not unless you wanna either kill it or go to interim study, but we have four weeks left, and I think we need to spend some time understanding this better. And what I want to do when we do meet next time, review this bill, put down what questions you have so that we can take action. And if, and if you have questions, let me know ahead of time so we can try to get the right people there at the meeting. Oh, yeah. The, um, we're going to be having uh, a bill referred to us after it passes the full house next week, and that's the marijuana bill. And that, mar that marijuana bill has to do with the state operating the special uh, businesses that only sell marijuana. So the state will operate like they do with liquor. They'll own the, the marijuana stores and they will sell and get the markup. And they will uh, contract with the growers and the growers have to, which provides the material, have to be in New Hampshire. And uh, they also estimate that the amount of business uh, profits that they come up with could easily be $250 million or more. So we need to understand those issues. We're not going to deal with the policy, but we're going to deal with where the, it's a money issue. How are they raising the funds? and all the issues associated with that. And then, because the federal government doesn't allow money uh, associated with marijuana sales to go through the regular banking system, if they can't come up with one, they want to generate their own banking system. So. <laughs> can I, uh, can 
it's going to be very interesting, and that that will be coming to us. Can I interject a few things on that? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, the banking thing. We already t we already talked to Representative Hunt about this because he he covers banking. His, his first reaction is no, <laughs> no way. But you know, it can't go to two committees. But I, I think we'll we'll probably have Representative. That was that was last minute amendment to the bill, uh, and the banking uh, the. Head of the banking bankers association approached me, and said they have big concerns about going to state bank. And that's why I talked to Hunt. Uh, he has concerns too. But anyway, that's that's that. And then, uh, so the way it's going to work is that there'll be private growers, X number, which will be unlimited marketplace driven. That's going to that are going to generate business profits taxes, and they're going to be manufacturers that are going to make edibles. That would also be free enterprise. That would be the only thing that's going to be retail is going to be these actual stores. It'll be set up, and in, in, in organizationally, they have it set up like the Liquor Commission, under the Liquor Commission, actually. It's going to be liquor. It's going to change the name of the Liquor Commission to Liquor and, uh, liquor and uh, Cannabis Commission. Yeah. That's all in the bill. We'll be getting into those details yeah, right, right. Um, so when we get the bill. And, and what was told to us is that at least half the funds would come from the sale of these so-called cookies. And so we'll need to get, I know myself, I'll need to get educated. I don't know about the younger people. So, so we're going to have brownies. Uh, but Representative Nunes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to, for, for disclosure, I'm a co-sponsor of that bill. And I look forward to the discussion on this. There is a way that uh, this can move forward being handled by the state and also benefit all the people of the state of New Hampshire. And those discussions will come forth with uh, the presentation that will be given to you. Uh, I think this is going to be a very interesting hearing. It sure will be. Thank you, sir. Representative Almey. Thank you. If we're going to be talking about a state bank, shouldn't we be talking to the banking commissioner? Yes. There's a lot of, a lot of issues. Uh, we don't have the bill yet, but I just want to let you know it's coming. So listen next week. We'll probably be on the floor. They'll be discussing it. And, uh, we and shouldn't we'll be discussing it. it if we don't have samples in front of us. <laughs> uh, anything else, Mr. Chair? Uh, do you have any idea when we might be coming back in to do some committee work here? Any yeah. rough idea? Yes, the week after next. Next week is a busy week. Uh, and so it'll be the week right after that. So right. don't wait until then to come up with your questions or, or recommendations. Let me know if there's somebody that we need to contact to meet with us at the work session so we don't waste time. Representative Almey. Uh, right. Uh, 1565, I think I keep on getting that number wrong. But um, Representative Aaron's bill. Uh, I really think there must be some way we could talk with a member of the commission besides on um, Attorney Buffetti, who has been. Uh, uh, agreed by the commission is their only spokesperson. But I do think it would be useful if we could get somebody other than the Attorney General's office to also talk with us about it. Yep. Let me work on that. Yeah. Uh, and Mr. Chair? Mr. Chair? I, I, I agree, and I, I would also like to see um, representatives from other counties come and talk to us because we've we've heard from people from Sullivan County as well, you know, solely. Uh, I know that there are probably some uh, representatives from Coas or Cheshire or some of the other counties that might want to weigh in on this. Okay. I can work on finding some folks yeah. if you like. I'm finding that very difficult because in my own county, uh, most of the people who should have known about this don't know anything about it. And uh, and
and it's my um, senior county commissioner who is the chair for uh, for all of the county commissioners in New Hampshire and signed several letters that aren't entirely uh, in agreement with each other about this. Um, and she's changed her phone number and I don't know how to reach her. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm gonna have to try at the county level. Well, do what you can on the counties. I'll try to okay. see if I can get somebody from the commission. Okay, uh, and if I may, I, I would like to work with you, S Representative Almi, on this. If, if we can come to uh, some sort of agreement with it. Representative Ewey? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's some additional work that needs to be done. Some of the comments that were made, I asked to verify them and got an entirely different story from the other side uh, regarding who was participating, who wasn't participating, and, and there's we need more information, a lot more information before we go further on that. Yeah. We have our work cut out for us on this. Uh, anything else? Then that was the last bill we had to discuss. Oh. I didn't realize we'd be through so early. So um, take a break. We appreciate it. <coughs> and remember next week we have a session on Wednesday and Thursday. The session Wednesday starts at 1 o'clock. Thank you. We're closed. <laughs> we are adjourned. Thank you. Did you, everybody sign the card? Yes, I remember. I remember. You know what? I, I have two emails. And I'm getting over 100 emails on every one of them. Yeah, because it's probably not even, they're not even aware yeah. of the date that we're meeting. Right. Because now it's, it's not in the calendar or anything like that. It doesn't care. Yeah. I know. Um...